I'm going to give you a name for it. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's called Corn Dog. So it's called what? Corn Dog. It's not called Corn Dog. Oh, yeah. Is corn it dog. called Corn Dog? There's nothing better than a good Corn Dog with some mustard and, and uh, ketchup. But he doesn't step into the huddle and say Corn Dog. Oh, no, he says Corn Dog. Now back to Damon and Ratto on 95.7 The Game. It is a Warriors Wednesday brought to you by Friedman's Appliance, a trusted name since 1922. Visit Friedman'sAppliance.com today. Steve Kerr will join us live at 5, but right now we're talking to the King about corn dogs and Super Bowls and off-season plans. We're kind of putting a bow on the entire NFL season. Peter King, nice enough to join us for his weekly Hey, How Are You? here on Damon and Ratto. And that that bit of information you uncovered, talking to Andy Reid about the play that won the Super Bowl, basically. They ran it to both sides of the field. I guess that's corn dog right and corn dog left. Is that what we're, we're looking at here, Peter? Yeah, I mean, you know, so you saw in a bit of an ugly way how the sausage was made because, honestly... I, I, okay, so let, let me set the scene a little bit for you. Two weeks before this game, at the end of the AFC Championship game, I spent 10 minutes with Andy Reid in his office after the game, uh, and I said, hey, listen, when you win the Super Bowl, I'm going to want to spend some time with you after the game, and I really want to write and talk about the winning play, the winning pass in this game. And so, obviously, you're buttering him, buttering him up a little bit. But I've known Andy for a long time. Did you know that when Andy played football at Brigham Young when he was in college, his goal in life, he's written this, was to write about football for Sports Illustrated. <laughs> and uh, so that's what he wanted to do. He didn't ever think he'd be in the NFL. And he wasn't in the NFL as a player, but obviously he's been in the NFL as a coach. I met him in 1995 covering the Green Bay Packers when he was the tight end coach for the Packers. So I've known him now for whatever is that, 28 years or whatever it is. So so anyway, the point, the only reason I say that is that I told him a couple of weeks ago that I wanted to uh, talk to him about the winning play in the game. Uh, that he would call, obviously. And so, you know how everybody says sports writers don't root uh, for teams? I don't root for teams. I root for my story. And I knew my story would probably be better at the end of the day if Kansas City won, even though I think I was going to get some good stories out of Nick Sirianni as well. But anyway, the point is that, you know, at the end of this game, I went down to see Andy Reid, and he told me about this. And I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know how it was portrayed in the video. My videographer, Annie Koblitz, this was a cubicle that we were in, a very small office. And she scrunched herself into the corner and barely could fit our two large bodies into the, you know, into the video. But anyway, I when he when the first thing he said was corn dog, I'm thinking to myself, he's he's kidding me. That's the, he they don't call a play corn dog, and and again they did call the play corn dog. As Eric B. Enemy told me, I don't know, ten minutes later, he go. I said, why in the world you call it corn dog? And he said, well, because we like to eat, <laughs> and uh, you know the coaching staff, and but really. If you think of what coaches do when they name plays is they name it based on, like, corn, okay? This was a corner route run by Kadarius Tony, And so <clears throat> when you say that it is corn dog, you got to figure that something in there has corn as the first syllable. And it was. It was a corner route. So Kadarius Tony sprints on jet motion, stops, comes back, runs a corner route, and that's it. But anyway, that's sort of the, the story of Corn Dog. Um, do most play, uh, I don't want to say gadget plays because that's demeaning to the play, but do most plays get called in the huddle like that, just like two words and you're done? Or do they Ray, do they like to Ray, wrap I'll themselves up in that verbiage? Is, that is a great question, okay? And, you know, a bunch of people have said to me, there's no way Mahomes would in the, the, the thing and called corn dog. 
I'll tell you the reason why Andy Reid did not want to tell me every word of the route. It's because a lot of those, a lot of the words in the route, the first, you know, six or seven words in what Mahomes said in the huddle are basically the words of the formation that they use. So if they give away the words of the formation that are used, Andy Reid's going to have to go to training camp next year and, you know, change the words of the formation. And at the end of it, the end is the words of the running play that Patrick Mahomes is going to call because, remember, on this play, this was not supposed to be a pass to Kadarius Toney. The number one thing when they left the huddle <laughs> was that Patrick Mahomes was probably going to hand this to Jarek McKinnon, who was a sidecar to him as the uh, shotgun quarterback in the backfield. The reason why he changed his mind and did not give the ball to Jarek McKinnon is very simple. He is supposed to look when when Kadarius Tony goes into motion. Patrick Mahomes' job at that moment is to see when Kadarius Tony turns around and goes back to the sidelines, is anyone following him? If somebody is right on him, he's going to hand the ball to Jared McKinnon. But what he saw at that moment was that that uh, no one was following. Kadarius Tony back to the sidelines. As soon as the ball was snapped, Tony ran a sideline route, and there were no Philadelphia Eagles within 11 yards of Kadarius Tony when he caught the ball. Easiest touchdown Kadarius Tony will ever catch in his life. Easiest one, and he caught it at a crucial time in the Super Bowl. Peter King with us here on 95 7 The Game. There is so much to like about Kansas City, looking at them for the fun that they are in the moment, looking at Mahomes already as an historical figure, watching Andy Reid take you know the pretense out of coaching by calling a play corn dog. Like there's so much to like and and be mesmerized by by this dominant offense that we've seen the Chiefs have for five plus years now. But are we maybe and I hate to work only on the side of the negative, sort of blowing our coverage of the Super Bowl because this really is, I think, maybe as much as a defensive breakdown for a team that actually walked into a Super Bowl with an impressive defensive reputation yeah. as we've ever seen. Like, I'm not I trying mean, to say the Eagles blew it, but the Eagles no. blew it in the that Eagles second half. blew it. The Eagles blew it. And, Damon, I am so glad that you said that. And, look, great year for the Eagles fantastic year for the Eagles. They deserved everything that they got. They got a couple of breaks at the end, particularly against the Niners. I get it. I, I understand all that. But the Eagles proved that they were the second best team in football and quite honestly might easily have, not easily, but I mean, it would not have been at all surprising if they won the Super Bowl. But, you know, I wrote this in my column Monday and look, I do not have anything against Jonathan Gannon, the Eagles defensive coordinator Sunday night, now the Arizona Cardinals head coach. But I wrote this. I felt for Jonathan Gannon because if I were doing the interview in Tempe, Arizona on Monday before he got hired, I would have said to him, hey, okay, it's, it's understandable that a very rarely – called motion <clears throat> by Kadarius Tony would have resulted in a touchdown with 12 minutes left in the game. And okay, anybody can get can get fooled once. I understand. They only ran this once in 1200 previous offensive snaps this year. But they ran it with 12 minutes left in the game. And then 3 minutes later Three minutes later, on the next series, on the left-hand side of the formation, Sky Moore did it. And you know what Philadelphia did? Nothing. They blew it. So you're right. You're absolutely right. And look, I don't think it should prevent somebody from getting a head coaching job. 
I really don't. But what I do think is Jonathan Gannon and the Philadelphia defense needs to answer for this. You blew the Super Bowl by by horrible coverage on the two biggest touchdowns you allowed in the 2022 football season, period. How did that happen? Why did that happen? Why did you blow it? And if I were Michael Bidwill or, or Monty Austin Ford, whoever's doing the interview, I would have wanted to know that. Sirianni's losing both of his coordinators to head coaching opportunities. So what does next year look like for him and the Eagles? I know you spent quite a bit of the week around the Eagles and Sirianni. Um, how how will he forge on with a new coaching staff? Look, I, I interviewed on uh, a Wednesday afternoon during Super Bowl week, Howie Roseman, for about 20 minutes. He was on my podcast last week. He was frank and fantastic, I thought. And I have a lot of admiration for Howie Roseman. He easily, easily, they easily could have won this game. And if they did, it would have been Howie Roseman as the architect of two very distinct Super Bowl championship teams, five years apart, different coach, different quarterback, all different skill players. Okay, but, but okay, they lost the game. So where does that leave them now? And I think that is a really interesting question. Because they have a lot of defensive players, just pieces of the puzzle, who they have to figure out, are we going to pay them? Are we going to let them walk? Are we we going to really try to get uh, Jason Kelsey, our potential Hall of Fame center, to come back? Or just accept the fact that he's probably had enough and he's going to go. And what about the right guard? Isaac Sumalo, who is an excellent player, uh, who's also going to be a free agent. I think somebody is going to pay him bigger money than the Eagles will. So they may have to replace 40% of their offensive line. But I'll tell you why I'm bullish on the Eagles to come back strong next year. They have the best offensive line coach in football. His name is Jeff Stoutland. He invented a left tackle out of whole cloth. You know, in Jordan Mailata, who is a rugby player out of Australia, and Jeff Stoutland's work has made him an above average to very good left tackle in the NFL. He's got a great right tackle in Lane Johnson. They're going to be okay on the line because of Stoutland. But, and they're going to be great because of uh, Jalen Hurts. But <clears throat> I think the one thing to think about with this team right now, How many defensive pieces are they going to miss? And I think they're going to lose quite a few of them because, as you guys know, can't pay everybody. Um, You mentioned Jonathan Gannon. Uh, You didn't mention Shane Steichen, but we'll just throw him in the the mix here since he got the job in Indianapolis. It brings up the age-old question, what does Eric Biennemi have to do to become a head coach in this league? Is the answer any different than it was a year ago or three years ago? Or is he simply pigeonholed as the guy you have to talk to, even though you have no intention of hiring him? Well, in this particular year, he interviewed with the Indianapolis Colts. I was told that the Indianapolis Colts, and look, this doesn't mean anything because they didn't hire him. I was told that they were very impressed with him. The whole issue, I think, I, well, I shouldn't say the whole issue because I can't read Jim Irsay's mind. I can't read Chris Ballard's mind, the general manager in Indianapolis. But the thing I can tell you is that teams put a premium on offensive coordinators who call the plays. Shane Steichen calls the plays. And, you know, In this particular case, Andy Reid calls the plays and Eric Bieniemy does not. Now, I'm not saying that's everything. It isn't everything, obviously. But Shane Steichen calls the plays and that gives him an advantage when he goes in to do interviews. (laughs) So, to me, I think that's a factor. But I think it 
becomes a little bit hollow after a while. When Kansas City has had this phenomenal success, and uh, and and obviously they have had one uh, high-profile offensive assistant, Matt Nagy, get a head coaching job in Chicago and bomb out, and so you say, well, why hasn't the enemy gotten a chance? It's a very good question to ask. And if I were the NFL, I'd be outraged that they went one for five and a two time Super Bowl winning offensive coordinator, Eric B. Enemy, is not number two. Peter, let's ask you about the new defensive coordinator of the San Francisco 49ers, Steve Wilkes. He gets to sit down with a group that is, you know, very much ready to go out and play as they are right now. We'll see what the offseason brings him in terms of some fancy new toys, maybe a new interior uh, defensive tackle, maybe a new corner to work with, a safety. What is atop the Wilkes wish list as he gets ready for his first year with Kyle Shanahan? If I were Steve Wilkes, if they asked me if for one player in free agency who I could have, I would say I want Javon Hargrave, the defensive tackle of the Eagles. That is the guy who, in my opinion, is going to get rich somewhere. I don't know where. I don't think Philadelphia will start re-sign him because I think Philadelphia believes in their uh, in their ability to develop and, uh, and mine for new players all the time. Um, I mean, it won't shock me if they re-sign Javon Hargrave, but he's been a great player for them. And I think an interior force, on the defensive line would be a great thing for Wilkes to add. But, look, I like Steve Wilkes. His players love playing for him. I think it's an excellent hire. And I don't think he has the kind of ego to say, hey, listen, we want you to continue what Robert Sala and uh, and D'Amico Ryan have started. We want to continue with much the same stuff we were doing on offense or on defense. I don't think Steve Wilkes has the kind of ego to say, I have to put my fingerprints all over this. And I'm sure that he told Kyle Shanahan in his interview the exact same thing. Uh, Next time this year will be the 20th anniversary of the last time a team won back-to-back Super Bowls. If we accept the thin read of history here and assume that the Chiefs will not repeat, who's your best choice to win next year? Eagles. I love Jalen Hurts. <clears throat> I love the development program of Howie Roseman. Um, and my number two team there would be either San Francisco uh, or Buffalo. I think Buffalo is going to come back with a vengeance. Um, I, I think that they got socked in the jaw. They thought that they had everything to build a new, excellent long-term team. <laughs> and they got beat up by Cincinnati in the playoffs. And look, Cincinnati could come back too. I think Cincinnati's going to start to get picked off a little bit with its players. I think the Bengals got very lucky. They kept their offensive and defensive coordinators, um, you know, from leaving. And I get that. But tell you what, the Bengals cannot pay everybody in this year. They have to pay Joe Burrow, and they got they got to get ready to pay T Higgins and Jamar Chase. So I don't I think the draft is going to be really, really important for the Bengals this year. Uh, but I, I would say I would say those are the teams that I would expect to see next year. Peter, let's go through a real quick off season quarterback lightning round, starting with the 49ers week one. Brock Purdy or Trey Lance, who's starting? Brock Purdy, I just think that Kyle Shanahan is not going to forget eight wins in eight games in huge, huge moments and getting his team within three quarters of playing in the Super Bowl. Derek Carr, how much did the Raiders blow his departure? What's the best landing spot for people to maybe see him in a different light? I don't know enough about what happened this year in Las Vegas to blame either side, but I do know this, that Josh McDaniels was absolutely in love with Derek Carr, when I saw McDaniels and Carr together at the end of July, something happened. It is weird to see them give up Derek Carr for nothing. 
And I think Carr, just a gut, gut feeling. This is not on any inside information. My gut feeling is he ends up in New Orleans. You have the ability to put Jimmy Garoppolo in the best situation you can. Where are you plopping him? I would put him in Houston, and I would say to whoever Houston is going to draft this year, you are going to be like Carson Palmer, his rookie year in Cincinnati when he had John Kitna. This will be different. Jimmy Garoppolo is better than John Kitna was. But you are going to sit and learn from a respected, smart NFL veteran. You tell Jimmy Garoppolo, we're signing you for two years. You're our guy. We want you to be our guy long term. But there are no guarantees. We just don't know. And look, (laughs) is it possible that a team like the Jets could blow him out of the water with a huge offer? It's possible. But my gut feeling, and that's all it is, is that the Jets are really going to try to try hard to sign Aaron Rodgers. My last question for you, Peter. What's your gut telling you the Bears do with Justin Fields? And if they were to trade him, what's a fair ask? In my opinion, I think the Chicago Bears would be idiots to trade Justin Fields. Idiots. Period. Here's the reason. He showed you enough before he got totally beat up this year that you don't need to get rid of you don't need to get rid of Justin Fields. You need to get two more wide receivers on this team. And and I I have to tell you after watching football this year, I am shocked. You draft a quarterback high in the first round <laughs> to be your guy long term. I want you to tell me one thing that Justin Fields hasn't done to deserve a third year and, and, and all that. And and quite honestly, if Justin Fields isn't the guy, is there anybody in this draft who is a no-doubt guy who you're going to take number one overall? Right. Andrew I Luck's not waiting. Is. Yeah, you got to keep you got to keep Justin Fields. Peter, every single week we get to tap into your connections, your wisdom, your view of the league and it makes us a better show, it makes our audience a more informed audience and we thank you again for another outstanding year. I don't know I don't know how the, the year was for the NFL, but you had a hell of a year, Peter King. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it, Damon. Thanks, Ray. You guys take care. Thank you very, very much. Peter King. Good stuff. All year long, good stuff with Peter King.